Yeah, this is Black Light, and uh, we on that technology as usual. Let's get right to it. We're talking about the IRS and tax season. See, according to this uh, Constitution, only Congress has the right to coin money, see. And in the Constitution, uh, there was only one tax, direct taxes, because uh, the founding fathers was trying to break away from taxes. Yeah, they uh, wanted to have their independence from England, the British, and the British was taxing them. That's where you had the Boston Tea Party. Now, a lot of y'all don't pay attention those sort of things. I mean, when I was young, I didn't pay attention to that either. Uh, I felt like uh, couldn't nothing hold me back. I was going to get what I wanted. But I still didn't understand the ins and outs of this system. You know, and why slavery wasn't on my mind at that time. I thought we were free. Say the home of the brave and land of the free, but it's really the home of the slave and ain't nothing free. Freedom ain't free. So, you know, when we were so-called free, uh, started to integrate everything started going to shambles and so uh, we can prove this in a matter of a second that uh, before we wanted integration we were better off when we were when we were building for self now the Honorable Elijah Muhammad showed us that uh, we don't need this system to do for self because he built uh, a 60 multi-million, I put it like this, a multi-million dollar system in the Nation of Islam. He had farms, he had banks, his own banks. You know, just like the uh, the so-called uh, Middle Easterners got their own banks and their own businesses doing for self. What about the Chinese? You know, they doing for self. What about the even the Spanish-speaking brothers and sisters are doing for self. You know, only ones not doing for self is us. We doing for someone else and not self. So this is George Washington. He had slaves at the same time when he was fighting the British, trying to be free. Didn't want to pay no taxes to Great Britain. But somehow, over a little period of time, Great Britain, through through the uh, Rothschilds, got control of the Congress. Why is why ain't nobody talking about that? Why ain't nobody talking about it? We gonna talk about it. So let's just uh, let the Caucasian blow the whistle on the system. Listen to him, because you might not believe me. But you believe that white boy. So 
intellectual historians might put the roots of the American Revolution earlier, but I'm going to start with the end of the Seven Years' War in 1763, which, as you will recall from last week, was one, expensive, and two, a victory for the British, including British subjects living in America, who now had more land and therefore more money. Right, so in 1765, the British government was like, hey, since we went into this debt to get you all this new land, we trust that you won't mind if we pass the Stamp Act, in which we place a fancy stamp on your documents, newspapers, playing cards, etc., and in return, you give us money. Well, it turns out the colonists weren't so keen on this, not so much because the tax was high, but because they had no direct representation in the parliament that had levied the tax. And plus, they were cranky about the crown keeping large numbers of British troops in the colonies even after the end of the Seven Years' War. And then the British government was like, you are inadequately grateful, and the colonists were like, shut up, we hate you, and the British government was like, as long as you live under our roof, you live by our rules, and so on. But eventually the British backed down and repealed the Stamp Act. The repeal inspired a line of commemorative teapots, thereby beginning America's storied tradition of worthless collectible ceramics. But in the end this only emboldened the colonists when the British tried to put new taxes on the Americans in the form of the Townsend Act. These led to further protests and boycotts and most importantly more organization among the colonists. The protest escalated. 1770 saw the Boston Massacre, which with its sum total of five dead was perhaps the least massacre massacre of all time. And in 1773, a bunch of colonists dumped about a million dollars worth of tea into Boston Harbor in protest of British government decisions that actually would have made British tea cheaper. Oh, it's time for the open letter? Ah, oh, that did not go well. An open letter to tea. But first, let's see what's in the secret compartment today. Oh. It's a gigantic tea bag. Hmm. Let's see what flavor it is. Bitter tyranny variety. Dear tea, like all Americans who love justice and freedom, I hate you. But I understand you're quite popular in the UK, where the East India Company would periodically go to war for you. But what fascinates me about you, tea, I mean, aside from the fact that people will choose to drink you when there are great American refreshments available like Mountain Dew, is that even though you're stereotypically English, you're not English. It's Chinese or Burmese or Indian, no one really knows, but it's definitely not English. You didn't even have tea until like the 1660s. Posers? Best wishes. John Green. So the Boston Tea Party led to further British crackdowns, and then mobilization of colonial militias, and then Paul Revere, and then actual war. But you can hear all about that stuff on, like, TV miniseries. I want to focus on one of the ways that colonists protested on their taxation. Let's go to the thought bubble. As previously noted, the English crown benefited tremendously from the import of consumer goods to the American colonies, and one of the most effective ways American colonists could protest taxation without representation was by boycotting British products. In order to enforce these boycotts, the protesters created committees of correspondence, which spread information about who was and was not observing the boycotts, and these committees also could coerce non-compliers into compliance, which is to say that they were creating and enforcing policy, kind of like a government does. The Maryland Committee of Correspondence, in fact, was instrumental in setting up the first Continental Congress, which convened to coordinate a response to the fighting that started in 1775. This was back when Congresses did things, by the way. It was awesome. Anyway, the Continental Congress is most famous for drafting and approving the Declaration of Independence. No, it's all bubble. That's the real Smith vehicle, Independence Day. I mean the Declaration of Independence. Right, that one. It's not your fault. You guys are Canadian. You've never declared independence. Worth noting, by the way, that the Congress edited out more than a quarter of Jefferson's original declaration, and he forever after insisted that they, quote, mangled it. Anyway, I would argue the heavy lifting of the American Revolution was already done by the Declaration. In truth, by the time the shooting started, most of the colonists were already self-governing and had developed a sense of themselves as something separate and different from Great Britain, as evidenced by these committees of correspondence, which functioned as shadow governments, eventually reaching out to foreign governments, establishing an espionage network, tarring and feathering loyalists and royal officials, which, by the way, is incredibly painful and dangerous to the victim, and even recruiting physicians to tell American men that drinking British tea would make them weak and effeminate. Thanks, Thought Bubble. Now, despite all this, about 20% of colonists remained loyal to Great Britain throughout the war, especially in the major cities that Britain occupied. Also, lots of slaves continued to support the British, especially after Britain promised that any slaves who fought with them would be free. And it's... So there you hear, you hear the British owe us, they owe us reparations too. They owe us reparations too, because we was enslaved to them, and uh, enslaved to... The United States, too, also. So, uh, they are probably all of Europe owe us reparations. So, but when they came in, the uh, Federal Reserve came in. 
and uh, got the income tax going on, you're paying taxes out your out your teeth, property taxes, taxes on goods and services, income taxes, all kind of taxes, hidden taxes, like license, you know. But anyway, all this is because you're living in a debt economy. And the average European Caucasian citizen is still better off because of the fact that it's his country. And they're actually fighting a war right now uh, with uh, Donald Trump, with uh, cleaning the swamp. Well, all this goes back to uh, Israel a Zionist because Rothschild is a he was a Zionist Jew now we distinguish the Zionist Jew from the re regular Jew because they don't subscribe to that Zionist methodology but Henry Ford the one that opened the eyes about how the Zionist Jew works. We're going to get into that later too. But you heard the uh, Caucasian breaking it down real fast. I hope you could keep up with him. How he was breaking it down. Now we, when all this was taking place, the black man was a slave, wasn't even considered human, he was property, still is, still is that way, they're trying to trick us because we don't know no better, they, they're trying to say, well, you know, y'all just like us, no, why a black man get stopped walking down the street, delivering papers, barbecuing, cutting his own grass, standing in his front yard. First of all, he's just getting stopped by driving. Now he's getting stopped by walking, going into his own apartment building, calling the, the, the Caucasian ladies, calling the police on him. This is Black Light. Stay tight.